So uh, welcome back to our master master's um, uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Mark Mattingly Scott, who is uh, trying to teach us through a friendly conversation about quantum computing. This uh, second conversation is going to be about some of his favorite examples in the area. And uh, again, I'm not quite sure how concrete one can be with a technology this new, Mark. So what examples can we talk about? Um, we can talk about three kind of fundamental types of problems where um, quantum computers are going to change uh, how we compute things. Um, and the first group of examples are really things that came out of or were derived from or resulted from uh, Richard Feynman's um, demonstration that uh, quantum computers or qubits would accelerate the simulation of, of uh, entanglement in the early 80s. Um, that basically led to the um, the insight that simulating materials, simulating atoms and molecules and things was going to be acceleratable using quantum computers. Um, and essentially what you do is you take any kind of, I don't know, molecule or thing, material, and you map the quantum mechanical description of that system to qubits in a reasonably scalable way. Um, at the atom level, you um, you can map energy, what are energy levels, essentially energy levels to qubits, um, and then through an iterative process, um, solve those energy levels. And once you've solved those energy levels, you can look at, you can use that to infer um, information about, for example, what a molecule looks like in three dimensions or what its binding energy is, how efficiently it will interact with or react with other molecules. Um, what that means in practice is for things like uh, chemical chemical production um, in the area of, uh, well, uh, basically everything, but um, things like energy, energy chemistry batteries, uh, uh, efficient solar cells, those kind of things. That's all about getting very, very efficient materials and using quantum computers to do that will speed those things, speed those uh, development processes up. Also in the area of pharmaceuticals. So, you know, one of the things you're concerned about when, you've, when you're doing pharmaceutical research, the first step is, have I got an active substance which does something? And can I show it doing something in mice or rats or whatever. Uh, and then the challenge then becomes, can I find a way to deliver that in a way in humans, which doesn't kill them? Um, and then can I develop that so that it's uh, dosage and, uh, and means of administration are um, tenable? Accelerating that process because you, for example, you can simulate what a molecule does um, will, will have enormous impact if you look at the cost of developing a pharmaceutical a single drug it's in the billions um if you can accelerate that um it will have an economic impact of course for the pharmaceutical companies and for patients uh, but it will also mean we get a, uh, a step nearer to to uh, bespoke um and individualized um uh, therapy regimes so we may see some uh, some some significant speed up in those processes in the in the midterm. So that's materials, pharmaceuticals, battery design, materials design, surface design. Um, the next area really comes out of. Can I? So, sorry, sorry, Mark. Yes. Uh, you mentioned pharma usage. You mentioned. Uh, other kind of construction materials or other you mentioned batteries and it led me to think about energy solutions mm -hmm. so uh, norway norway is, is 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 fundamentally an energy uh, and natural resource uh, through advanced technology uh, nation uh, this could be applicable also to the new energy solutions for say whether it's hydrogen or 
what we're what we are really struggling with when we build for example offshore wind farms uh, is is creating them robust but flexible enough and, and 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 experimenting with the right kinds of materials and the chemistry of it might get a real push through something like quantum could, could well be um actually if you look at that entire um energy uh creation distribution storage and consumption that entire value chain um the materials part of it does come in it's an important factor so for example if you're using wind energy to directly generate hydrogen it's kind of a no-brainer if you're putting wind you know you're putting wind generators in the middle of the north sea using them to generate hydrogen is like fairly obvious there's water there and why not mm. um is that efficient I don't know at the moment, probably not, but could it be efficient? Uh, is there a lot of chemistry involved in making it efficient? Yes. Um, are there a, more efficient ways to store hydrogen than just as a gas or as a liquefied gas? Maybe. Um, there is work going on on that. Can quantum computing be used to accelerate that, improve that? It's uh, probably uh i wouldn't you know without knowing more about the details of the problem is that going to be relevant in what time scale but those are the kind of problems where quantum computing is at the f the front where it's about things behind that energy generation problem you talked about is a second class of issues if you like which is around logistics optimization what's the most efficient way to do things to combine things and that comes back to the second class of problems um, where we look at um, basically derived from the work that Peter Shaw did with his factorization algorithm. So coming back to Peter Shaw, what he did was he um, took a problem which is computationally indeterminate, factoring a number, um, and translated it into another form. So if you take two numbers and you multiply them, it's very fast and efficient on a classical computer. If you take a number and tie and determine what the factors are, it's horribly inefficient. It doesn't make a difference if you're talking, the number you're talking about is 15, because everybody knows that 15 is five times three. If the number you're talking about is a thousand bits long, it's in, in, incomputable. It would take billions of years on the fastest computer. Peter Shaw said, hmm, uh, Finding those factors is kind of like finding the fundamental frequencies in a musical chord. So if I, I sit at a piano and I play a chord, boom, um, then that chord actually consists of distinct notes. Assume the chord consists of two notes. If there's a way to translate the factorization problem into determining what notes those are, then this is what Peter Shaw did, essentially. He said, I can translate that factoring problem into something in the quantum domain, and then I, this is where uh, your brain's going to get fried here. So, and then I then use something called the quantum Fourier transform to identify what the factors are, and then I can translate it back and out pop the two factors. And it's incredibly efficient. That led, that work of Peter Shaw led to two things. First of all, everybody suddenly got concerned about cryptography, rightfully so. And the second, second thing is people started to look at are there other areas where we can use those principles to accelerate what are called classes of linear algebra problems. So factoring a number is a simple linear algebra problem. Um, inverting a matrix is another linear algebra problem. Algebra problem. Can we use a quantum computer or can we use qubits to invert a matrix fast, rapidly? Turns out you can. And uh, also, I think it was in the late 90s, uh, three researchers whose names I always forget, but their initials are H, H, and L, and the algorithm is called the H, H, L algorithm, um, proved a, or showed a way to exponentially speed up matrix inversion. Um, and since then we've had a whole class of you know algorithm research working on using qubits to solve those kind of problems there is a but with these problems to do that you need error corrected qubits you need qubits which behave perfectly um we don't have them yet 
And this leads to the third class of problems, um, which are essentially algorithms which don't, in general, don't prov provide this exponential speed up. They provide quadratic speed up, and they use the real qubits of today. Um, there is those, and although you find those algorithms around things like optimization, um, Monte Carlo analysis, uh, so where you're looking at you know lots of different alternatives to a problem, can you speed that up? Can you can you take your Turing non-deterministic Turing machine and speed it up a little bit? The answer seems to be yes, you can. You can speed it up quadratically. Um, quadratically means squared for the listeners. Um, squared doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're looking at big enough problems, it's the difference between doable and impossible. Mm -hmm. So those are the three classes of essentially the three classes of problems. And if you so look the first at one, so, 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 sorry, if I just go back, there was a, uh, the first class just summarizing. We need to stop a little bit and give, give people um, time to breathe. <laughs> so the first one was uh, materials technology simulating real things uh in in a in a incredibly incredibly much more fast way the second one was um computational problems like cybersecurity um cryptography things that require things like inverting a matrix and factorization oh, uh, also that also that class of problems also includes a lot of machine learning and ai because that's about inverting matrices so anything and and that's what I, what I wanted to get you get back with you on. So machine learning, AI. Uh, you, you mentioned Monte Carlo uh, simulations, for example. Uh, they were In the third category. The so third things, category. Things you can do with real qubits, which are real qubits are subject to errors. They're, you know, they lose their state after a certain amount of time. Um, and why and, are Monte Carlo simulations important? Where do they pop up? What sort of real-world problems do we see those in, just for our listeners? Well, the, the classic example is uh, from the finance industry. Uh, Monte Carlo simulation is used to uh, do things like um, options pricing, um, um, arbitrage, currency arbitrage, hedging, uh, risk analysis in the finance industry. Um, what you essentially do is you take your problem and throw ra throw random decisions at it and look at what what comes out, um, and then you repeat and rinse, repeat and rinse, repeat and rinse a number of times. And uh, Monte Carlo simulation says that given enough repetitions, you will get a statistically robust answer. What the quantum computer does is it accelerates that getting to a statistically robust answer quadratically. And that can be for, if you're, if you're managing a hedge fund, that can be, you know, huge difference in time. So given the effect, uh, uh, and, and these real qubits already exist. Yes. And yes. I don't know if you can buy them, but they exist. So whoever gets to using them uh, efficiently, uh, given the potential of earning money, in, in or whether it's hedge funds or controlling markets or uh, doing anything where type you know game semantics comes into play i can imagine the the income differential the income potential from somebody being able to do this is is just so huge yeah um in the finance industry typically these um Typically, a performance advantage, either in time or accuracy, of per thousands, um, is enough to dominate a market. So, if you can shave, you know, a fraction of a percent off the time to execute or the accuracy of the result, then you've just, you know, eradicated your your comp competition. Um, so the, you know, the sensitivity is very, very high. Just really, really small improvements. Um, and using a quantum computer to achieve those kind of even a small improvement um, is of such immense potential value that the uh, willingness to invest in the technology, to understand the technology, to start getting ready to use it is very, very high. 
So most banks, insurance companies, most financial institutions, the central banks, they're all very, very interested in quantum computing for that reason. Um, but also because in, in the you know hands of rogue people or your enemies, this could be a system uh, disruptive thing. Yeah, I, but I don't think that's specific to quantum computing. That's the same with every technology. Every technology that could be used for benign purposes can be misused. Uh, just look at human history. Um, it's it's an absolute, you know. It's it's a kind of constant in human uh, human nature. Um, then the the question then becomes is, you know, um, it's not optional. You can't ignore a technology for two reasons. First of all, it will give you an advantage, and secondly, if you don't take it seriously, you will be at a disadvantage disadvantage that may be just commercially or it may be socially it may be it's so disruptive that uh, the potential is there to you know to change so much um you you better be in front of that technology you better understand how it works what the implications are you better be ready for it um so, what, so that Mark, means what, what you're saying I'm, I'm trying to simplify I'm, I'm using my lego language now uh, so you're saying that you have a choice, you know, to say this is too complex for me and I'm waiting. If you're running a central bank or are in charge of some very systemic cybersecurity um, stuff in, in, in defense. or But then what you're risking is that whoever moves first will define how this will play out. Yes. Uh, but as I say, that's not specific to quantum computing. That's Every technology that's come or come along, every technology from gunpowder to going back to your, you know, the, the, the gunpowder example, um, or the invention of the longbow uh, and the British archers at Agincourt. So apologies to the French viewers. Um, every technological advance, um, the the potential is there, and if you ignore it, then at your peril. Uh, and the central banks, um, as I say, they're, they're by and large, they're all very interested in quantum computing, which is actually quite encouraging. Uh, they're taking it seriously. Um, the banks certainly are. And um, uh, I think uh, if you look at, you know, the, uh, the less salubrious countries on this planet, they're also looking at quantum computing um, and how to use it and almost certainly how to misuse it. So it's just a technology like every other. It cannot be ignored. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about two possible areas uh, in addition to the ones that you... So you've kind of given us three types of problems, but it's still abstract to many listeners who are not computer people. But I heard you speak about applications in robotics and autonomous cars and uh, satellites and what you called disconnected uh, things. And then I also want to ask you about possible applications in computer centers. Okay. So where, where quantum computing is coming from right now is a, from a legacy of compute centers. So um, the, you know, the electromagnetic qubits based on electron spin and, uh, and photonics, they all need to run at very low temperatures, which means you need cryogenics, uh, very low temperatures, which in general means you've got a kind of like an inverted steam engine uh, uh, technology. Um, it can, uh, you need to be in a compute center, you need infrastructure. And typically that also means that you're then accessing that machine via some kind of cloud service. Um, and most of the players on the, the quantum scene are providing quantum computers and qubits through that model. So, so um, sorry. So this is, this is too many concepts and too complex. So, when you say cryogenics, my first uh, association is Peter Thiel and where he's going to go when he dies, <laughs> basically being frozen. But this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a very, very cold environment uh, where you can have your computing center. And that's where these qubits work in a relatively mm -hmm. non-disturbed fashion. Or, or do I have the wrong image? Kind of. You're getting there. So... Um, actually, the physical location of the, the compute center is not not important. What is important is that within that compute center, you have a computer, quantum computer, 
And within that quantum computer, there is there's a whole bunch of electronics and interface and, and IO and networking, which is standard stuff. But there is also what's called a cryostat. Typically, this is, I don't know, a few tens of centimeters or a meter across and maybe a meter or a meter and a half high. Um, and inside that cryostat, the cryostat is normally made of a special kind of metal, which basically eliminates magnetic fields inside the cryostat. Um, it's under an ultra-high vacuum, so within a, a volume of maybe one and a half, two cubic meters, you've probably only got a handful of, of nitrogen and oxygen molecules bouncing around. Um, and it's at a very, very low temperature. It's at around... You know, it depends on the technology, from a few millikelvin to um, less than a kelvin. Kelvin is the measure of absolute temperature. So one kelvin is one degree above absolute zero. In order to get that, it's that environment, and especially in order to get the temperature down there, you need some advanced cooling. You're using mixtures of different helium isotopes in a... Uh, diffusion dilution refrigerator. I won't bore you with the details, but it's like your fridge at home. Um, but it's using two different kinds of helium to basically get the temperature. It takes a few hours to get the temperature at the business end of the quantum computer down to a few millikelvin. That's obviously, that works in a computer Sorry, center. I, I need a picture in my head. So there is this super cooling thing unit your yes. cryostat, and it is surrounding this thing that has all the qubits and does the computation, or it's inside? It's surrounding it. Right. So it's in a fridge, in a super so, uh, cool in a fridge. Super, in a super cold fridge. Um, in, order, and, uh, in order to interact with the qubits, you need some electronics. Um and that's a that's a challenge in itself is those electronics need to work at the same temperatures. It's not trivial. But essentially it's 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 more or less doable. So you have these super super cool superconducting qubits, you have some electronics to interface with them, and then um those signals go outside the cryostat, and then you've got sort of traditional electronics around it which allow you to in, interact with the, the the qubits and do things with them. And then normally what you do with that is those electronics and that interface, you then embed that in a cloud service so people can access the quantum computer via the cloud. Um, and that's what Honeywell and IBM and Alpine Quantum and um, almost all quantum computer manufacturers are doing. Um, if you are using um, qubits based on nuclear spin, um, so you're able to run them at room temperature, particularly if you're using nitrogen and nitrogen vacancies to do that as quantum brilliances, um, then your qubits work at room temperature. Uh, the electronics become significant, the control electronics become significantly simpler. Um, and that's a technology where um, a quantum computer fits at the moment into a 19 inch rack unit. So 19 inch rack is a standard format for computer centers like this wide, this wide. Um, so it's about this high and there's the qubits are in there and the control electronics and you just slide it in and you can connect it up to whatever, the cloud if you want or a local machine or something. Um, the uh, So those room temperature quantum computers are, I, I believe, the future of quantum computing. Because if you remove that need for uh, superconductivity for for cryogenic systems, then and and additionally have simple electronics to control it, then it's all miniaturizable, which means you can start to really focus on making things small, portable, um, and potentially start to put them in places which you would never ever be able to do with a cryogenic quantum computer, unless unless you ensure that it's always connected and always has access to the cloud. And okay. there are lots of things where that's not possible. So again, <laughs> trying to, try to uh, kind of uh, find the, the bits of my brain that aren't fried yet. So we talked about this very, very strong fridge, freezer, 
and that's the cryogenic uh, based um, quantum which works really well but it's kind of not so practical because creating this bridge has its size limits the way i think i understood you but you say that there it's possible to use this other kind of quantum thinking something nitrogen something which i've forgotten what you said about some nitrogen vacancies and i won't yes. go there <laughs> and then <laughs> and that means that you can make a computer that both fits in the computer centers of today with these racks but it's possible to uh, miniaturize even further eventually which makes it extremely useful for all kinds of built-in Yes. And that's where we are getting to things like cars and robots and internet of things. And aerospace. So if you don't have any connectivity, if you're if you're literally f disconnected from any kind of network or if you're in an environment where connectivity is a challenge, so things like mining, if you're underground or heavy machinery where there's a lot of electromagnetic interference or a steel plant where you know in st any kind of any kind of heavy industry anything that's robotic disconnected anything that's in the air or in space or deep underground or under the sea shipping, shipping all these things where you have limited or no connectivity you'd like to have a quantum computing technology a quantum computer which can still work still be used um, and where you're not concerned about uh, providing a um, a quantum mechanically uh, silent environment, which typically well, almost always has to be done by you employing cryogenics. So cryogenics, is cryogenics miniaturizable? Maybe, maybe. Um, is it easy to produce a few millikelvin? No. You're always going to need helium. Helium-3, helium-4, diffusion pumps. You're always going to need ultra-high vacuum. Can you put that in uh, in your in your in your three in your three yeah. th D three uh, D uh, goggles? No. Could you put a diamond in the three D goggles? Absolutely not today, but um, in the timescales we're talking about, that's realistic. And then the the question, but the the, the key question here, Sylvia, is what can you do then that's useful with that quantum computer in that disconnected device? And then we come back to these three classes of, of problems, material simulation, anything to do with linear algebra, and um, things where you can use uh, variational methods. And Aaron, yes. Sorry, I have to talk in <laughs> pictures. So okay. um, Let's say you make this into not a 19 inch thing, but into a small pill that I could, or chip that I could build into my, build into my body. So it could oh. be my personal little laboratory that could uh. do all kinds of simulations and uh, analysis uh, for me, or I could build it into my car, which would make it many times as fast a learner and many times as safe or you know, where, where would we need uh, this immense amount of computation in things that are being built in? I can see a rocket on Mars, but... So um, we're in the realms of science fiction now, if it's in a pill and it's in, in your body. Um, uh, no idea if that's going to be possible and if, then when. Um, I think it's more realistic to look at... Um, where could you use this acceleration potential in devices which are not permanently connected? Mm -hmm. um, and typically, situations where you have the requirement for, or you would have the requirement for, very large computations if you ha if you had the possibility. So yes, it's things in robotics like. Um, uh, anything to do with sensing the environment, the way that's done today with graph, with GPUs, with uh, uh, special uh, environmental sensors, with LIDAR, um, the chips doing that, um, typically GPUs, typically consuming quite a lot of power. Um, and 
doing a good job, uh, but to train them, to train the models for those kind of uh, uh, application takes it still takes a very long time. Um, might it be possible to drastic, drastically accelerate learning in machine learning um, using quantum computers? May well be. You hear me saying may well be and using the subjunctive a lot because we don't know yet. That's why one of the key things is to start experimenting with and playing with these technologies in order to understand exactly where the benefit is, both in terms of performance and in terms of where's the first economic impact. Where can we expect the first situations where um, quantum computers actually show utility? So that's that's why everybody's everybody in the quantum computing business is talking to customers to understand where the benefit will come. And I guess the customers get their eyes crossed out or cro in cross, you know, <laughs> when you start talking to them. But uh, but uh, I, I, you know, I we're going to move on to our tools lecture in in a few minutes. But my I said the last question already, but still I have to ask you one more thing, Mark. And and you were there from the start of practical internet, and you've seen how. And I remember those days as well. I was at Alta Vista at some point mm -hmm. around then. And I remember that, you know, people were looking at this thing and saying, we see it's going to be hugely potent and disruptive. It's just that we don't know how to make money on it or what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me almost like you're in a similar situation now with quantum. You know, we can see that it's going to be disruptive like anything ever seen. It's just we don't know what to do with it. Yeah, so there are definitely parallels. Um, and it took from 1989 with uh, HTML and HTTP. Um, and the, I think back then it was pretty clear this is hugely disruptive. What does that disruption look like? No idea. Um, and it was in 1996 that the first kind of milestone in how it was going to dis disrupt happened. So we had the very first electronic commerce platforms ever. So end-to-end -end electronic commerce. And then it became a lot clearer about what's, you know, where's where's this particular rabbit going to run? Um, and a lot of what's happened since then, also in the area of, of monetization of search machines, monetization of uh, social networking, where we are the product, we just don't realize it. Um, all those things were then at the point where we had e-commerce foreseeable more or less whereas what's the parallel with quantum computing um we're beginning to see where that might come where there might be first impact again it's much more embedded in the the kind of the guts of reality so material simulation basically anything that can be optimized anywhere logistics Shopping, uh, transport, transportation, uh, anything of that nature. Um, if you're in that business, you need to get your eyes on quantum computing right now because it may well fundamentally change your business, um, and you you know you need to be aware of that. So we're at that kind of inflection point where it's not yet totally clear, but it's clear which industries will be impacted and who needs to look keep an eye on it. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, we're going to uh, finish our second lecture now and uh, in a couple of minutes meet for the third one where we're going to talk about, well, how do we get started then? Thank okay. you so far. Thank you.